be prepared for, and while we must expect more cases, everything that can be done is being done. Also, while I do not have the authority to ban travel from an FAA facility, I strongly urge everyone to avoid travel to the, to the Philippines or other affected areas. If you travel to Manila, I urge you to self-quarantine for no less than 14 days. I'm also in contact with Superintendent Fernandez and the leadership of private schools. We will be meeting tomorrow and issue guidance thereafter. While we know that the elderly are more susceptible, I am asking everyone to do what works. That's exercising social distancing. Avoid large social events and implement good hygiene. I know these things seem basic, but all evidence says these actions work to keep us safe. Every resource we have, every expert at our disposal is being used to implement our plan. We will do our part. We will all work together and Guam will rise to meet this challenge. And welcome back to the hotspot. Joining us live in studio is Governor Lulian Guerrero, thank you so much for being here with thank us. Thank you for having us, Sabina. You know, we played that video and I heard your reaction and I think Jason as well. We all kind of, we were there actually at that press conference. We got the last minute phone call from Crystal. How difficult was it for you to have to give that message to the people of Guam? It was very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I stayed up all night talking to, um, you know, my cabinet members, uh, mainly talking to public health. Uh, at the time, public health is in charge of infectious disease, and we just finished uh, going through the uh, dengue fever uh, outbreak. <clears throat> and nobody knew anything about this uh, virus. Uh, and so in order for me to feel that we would be safe, I felt that we didn't need to make the decision to uh, close our island. We couldn't... Um, we had no control over the airlines or all of that, but we did, we were able to uh, control and somewhat monitor people coming in. And the only uh, vaccine that we had at that time really was to close uh, our island. And we did that for a while, of course, but that was a very difficult time. Uh, everybody was just on full alert because you Were know, you scared though? I was. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was one of um, it was one of the most difficult and one of the uh, scariest time because knowing as a nurse how a pandemic uh, works and what results, and I was fearful for the lives of our people. At the time, you know, my main focus was to save lives, and I'll tell you, Sabina, when we would communicate with FEMA and CDC, and they would do this model, right, predictive model. Uh, they were predicting that if we didn't do anything uh, real urgently, quickly, and uh, respond with a lot of flexibility and a lot of emergency, we would stand to lose 3,000 people. That was their prediction. Yeah, and I remember that. Yeah. Um, it was Dr. Cabrera, he did the whole flow chart, right? And I had to look at that a few times because I wasn't sure, did that really say 3,000? Yes, so, yes but, it did. But here we are today, um, uh, 337, uh, Right, 337 yeah. uh, fatalities, over 46,000 uh, positive uh, cases, and this is just two years later. Um, I don't know, is there any lessons you think that you've, you've learned? Um, how do you feel that uh, your administration has handled the COVID response? You know, I believe really um, not just from experience, but also from full commitment that our leaders, my administration, myself, have, has responded extremely well uh, with this pandemic. Uh, we used science to base our decisions and data. And I also solicited the help of experts in the medical field, in the public health field, 
in the economic environment, in the hospital. And as I looked at everything, the overriding focus is save lives and do not overwhelm our hospital system and our healthcare delivery system. So those were the major, major guiding um, principles and focus that I used to make those decisions. And as you know, Sabrina, there were a lot of critics there, uh, but I'll tell you, uh, there were more people out there in the community that appreciated our quick actions and that they appreciated that I stood firm. And I was very confident in the uh, decisions that I made because of my uh, nursing background and my public health background. Uh, plus I knew who my experts were and who I would rely on. And the great um, attention that the federal government had uh, with us, CDC was very responsive. The Health and Human Services were very responsive um, and so forth. So we really had federal partners, we had local partners, and we had our experts. So I had all the positive factors in place to help with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, just recently uh, in one of uh, your latest address uh, regarding the lifting of uh, social media, um, social media, social, social gatherings, gathering, yeah. uh, restrictions and, and limitations. What about uh, the mask mandate? And also I'll just take it a step further, uh, the public health emergency right. in terms of lifting it. Right. Um, Mask mandates uh, for me would be the last thing that I would lift uh, just because I have seen its effectiveness. I'll just tell you as a side that uh, our incidence of respiratory infections, not COVID, but respiratory infections have decreased tremendously. And the doctors and uh, the nurses and public health infectious disease experts say it's because we wore our masks. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear very ma much about flu. You don't hear very much about the cold. So mask mandate, I think, is going to be uh, the most effective. It's the most effective and less, uh, I think, expensive and very simple to do to prevent uh, transmission and infection. As far as public health emergencies, uh, I will continue to issue public health emergency uh, executive orders as long as we remain in the high risk uh, status, and we are. We are still in the high risk status because according to CDC numbers, as we compare it, um, our um, positive cases per 100,000 is still pretty high. And once I start seeing that, and we start going through moderate, and I am assured that if we lift public health emergency, all other circumstances remain. Like for example, we will still get federal assistance. Okay. Can we still use uh, treatments that are uh, only uh, um, emergency authorized use? Uh, can we still get the vaccines? Can we still get our resources? Uh, if I lift the, the public health emergency. Programman uh, Salapi, Salapi it, it launches uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Applications are going to be uh, available for people to apply. Uh, it's at $300 uh, for one household. time. Yeah. Right. Some people are saying, Gov, it's, it's not enough. Well, what would you say to them? You know, we have, since this pandemic, put money into the hands of our people. We've done, it, we've done it by standing up a PUA system, which is of course the um, unemployment, and we got uh, great help from there. We did it for EIP, which we got great help from there also. We've done uh, local funds. We've done Program in Salapi the very first time. We've done the All Rice program. We've done Program in Salapi this version. There are also other um, sources of cash assistance that uh, we look at. SNAP, of course, which is your regular food stamp, which helps you with the expenses of your food. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, the emergency rental assistance, which helps you with your expenses for your housing. 
and utilities, and those are effective for 18 months. Then we now have the Mortgage Lending Assistance Program, which helps you with your mortgages. Uh, we are working very hard to put out uh, child care assistance, where we will give cash assistance to women and, and men who are caretakers of their children and also who send their kids to um, daycare. We will give them vouchers to help with that expense. So um, although this is one uh, help in many assistances, there are others that are have been and will continue as permanent uh, assistance. Of course, the, other, the most uh, permanent way to deal with this, Sabina, is of course create jobs. And in our working with the small business with our LEAP program, one of the reasons we are pushing those monies out to help small businesses remain operational is so that they can continue employing their employees and creating jobs. We work very close, so we need to look at the workforce, right? Workforce development. How do we shift people from hospitality now to other sources of econ economic um, assistance, right, or income, and that is shifting their skills, and we work very closely with um, GCC. So we don't just look at the immediate help, that's very important, but we also look at what we, uh, what is our uh, strategic direction to make it a much more permanent kind of assistance to improve the incomes of our people. What, what is the status of the investment Parahamzu uh, plan that you uh, unveiled? So the investment para, Parahamzu, which is our ARP mm -hmm. investment plan, that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to push money in there. We're continuing to push money for our um, housing. We're continuing to push money for workforce development. We're continuing to push money in for public safety and also highways and road construction, you see it very evident throughout the island and uh, many things like that that we would like to use. Education is another one uh, and healthcare of course is another. And I, I did want to ask uh, you before we do let you go, uh, one thing that the uh, pandemic has really uh, shown is our vulnerabilities in terms of uh, healthcare, the hospital. And so I know that you've uh, committed more than 100 million, I believe, for the construction of a new hospital. What What is the latest with that? Are we still looking at? So we are, yeah, we're still looking at Eagles Field. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna say that when we decided on Eagles Field, we did do surveys and assessment of other sites. And if you know where Eagles Field, it's very close to the highway, main traffic uh, point. And then it has infrastructure capacity and capabilities so that we don't have to, you know, prepare the land for uh, infrastructure that's not there. Uh, that's very important. And that's what I'm going to use the 100 million is to prepare the property, the land, so that when we are ready for construction, it's all ready for to build the hospital, public health, uh, Guam Behavioral Wellness Center. I'm looking at standing up a VA clinic there. Uh, so it's all in one consolidated area, Sabina, so uh, people don't have to be inconvenienced going from one place to another to get their healthcare services, their social services, and their mental health services. Well, again, thank you so much, Governor, for being our very first guest, our very first in-studio guest, I think, in two two years oh you're I'm honored yeah so you're <laughs> i guess to, tomorrow two years since we had our first three COVID cases uh we're coming uh, out of COVID, hopefully real soon uh, your message to the people of guam i just want to say uh, thank you for all that you have done to help us get where we are safe today um vaccinations i thank everybody for coming out rolling up their sleeves getting their shots I encourage boosting to continue doing that. Uh, testing also uh, to monitor where you're at. But I just basically wanted to say thank you for your patience and thank you for your love of your neighbor, your family, and in, of course, your commitment to protect your family and our community. I would not, and we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for you adhering to our initiatives and you know I do this for the love of our people and as a nurse knowing 
how it can get very dangerous and unsafe. So thank you again, and uh, we'll continue on with what we need to do uh, based on science and data. Thanks a lot, Gus. Thank you, Sabina. Stay and congratulations oh, thank on you. your launch. Thank you. <laughs> Stay tuned, the hotspot continues after the break.